by Don Kelly from right on touch. Plenty of distance, as you can see, it faded to the left. It's caught by Langland, who decides to run it out. Langland runs up the centre, gains about 20 yards. The Western Suburbs at last get possession. There's someone getting the ball away. But again, we loose. King will go over here. A tackle from behind, but he's dived over. The ball almost beat them then. It's almost 32 years to the day since that cold and grey afternoon at the famous Sydney Cricket Ground. At the time, no one would know that during the turmoil of the shared congratulations and commiserations, a moment would be frozen in sporting history. Hello, I'm Ray Warren. When Norm Proven and Arthur Summons came together on that sideline to share a handshake, a hug, a few words, it would take one small frame of film to capture that magic moment in rugby league. A moment that symbolises the modern era of the great game. It was all over in the blink of an eye, but Sun Herald photographer John O'Grady was able to capture the rival captains locked together in a muddy embrace. West Arthur Summons reveals a darker side to the fleeting moment. He believes to this day there were suspicions of a fix. I don't think I was going up and saying uh, too much uh, sportsman sort of things. I was a little bit dirty on the scene and <laughs> was reiterating the fact that I thought he might have played the referee. In 1982, the photograph entitled The Gladiators was reborn. Cast in bronze by sculptor Alan Ingham, it became rugby league's trophy for the modern era and the symbol of the game's finest ever sponsorship arrangement. But it was a year in which celebrations were overshadowed by concerns that several clubs were in financial difficulty and some close to bankruptcy. Sportscaster Ron Casey was critical of the league's decision to admit two one-city teams to the competition, Illawarra and Canberra. Now, if you've got one team for one area, one city like that, then you're going to have a gravitation of talent towards those teams. Canberra has proved the point, later Brisbane proved the point, and Newcastle, to a certain extent, is proving it now. If you've got one team to one city, they will always dwarf the city teams that are left behind. Even the Catholic Weekly spoke out, attacking the game for its commercialism and on-field violence. Jim Comans heightened his crusade against violence when his judiciary imposed a 15-month suspension on West Bob Cooper. Parramatta and Manly set the pace in 82, first Winfield Cup, recording back-to-back -back premierships. The traditional J.J. Gilton and Shield held aloft by the Eels captured the spirit of the game, and rugby league's gloomy times were forgotten. In the lose... I don't know what made me do it. I hadn't even spoke to my wife about it. I, I just came off the field and... I said, well, that's it, boys, I've had enough. I just hung the boots up on the, on the clothesline. After a sensational kangaroo tour that saw Australia go through Britain and France undefeated, rugby league found itself in the thick of events that would rock the old game to its very foundations. Friday, April 29, 1983, Lennon's Hotel in Brisbane and a meeting of the Australian Rugby League executive. Kevin Humphreys, rugby league's kingpin, steps down as president. Humphreys was at the centre of a Four Corners expose that concerned his acquittal on fraud charges in 1977. The ABC program was followed the next Monday evening by a dramatic announcement from Phillip Street. The seventh president of the New South Wales Rugby League resigned his position. Looking back, Humphreys, whose passion for the game was never in question, says his decision to stand down was clear-cut. And I didn't consider toughing it out because I didn't believe there was a lot of people in rugby league that wanted me to. There was a lot of people politically that wanted me to. However, I, I, I did not see that um, the game of rugby league could afford for me to be a tough big guy. I mean, I had my day in court and I was found guilty of an offence that um, I've accepted. Sweeping administrative changes followed. In May 1983, Tom Bellew became president of the New South Wales Rugby League. Ken Arthurson stepped down at Manly and became chairman of the ARL. It was certainly a time when we had to uh, take stock of ourselves and, uh, and reassess our position. We did try to do that by virtue of the fact that we engaged a, a team of business consultants to, uh, to, um, to do a restructure of the, uh, of the league for us. Um, 
point out to us how they felt that the administration should be structured. We, uh, we took advice from the media, we took advice from the public, we took advice from the players, we took advice from all the clubs. We, uh, we tried to collate as much information as we possibly could during that time. And out of it all, I, I, I think a lot of good came. Two months later, former international lock forward John Quayle beat 30 other applicants for the newly created position of general manager. The league's traumas continued, however. Some clubs were dying. Cronulla, Newtown and West were walking financial tightropes. The Newtown Jets were $1.5 million in debt and sweating on the sale of their league's club. Advertising man John Singleton, who was Newtown's president at the time, explains that a deal that would have seen Newtown transfer to Campbelltown fell through and the club's fate was sealed. We had no fallback position because we were totally indebted. We'd only played in 83 on rugby league money. We owed money to the league. Not, a, not much in today's terms, but we, had no, it wasn't, we could have paid the money off. We could have got it somehow, but where would we have gone? We couldn't stay at Newtown, we had no, that is demonstrably a failure. And we couldn't go to Campbelltown because uh, Campbelltown, by, which was really a one-man John Marsden band, had turned their back on us overnight so that we had neither juniors nor a ground, despite my having had the grandstand built by the Tab Fund. So unlike West, we had nowhere to go. On August 1, Henson Park played host to the Jets for the last time. On a night in September, the New South Wales Rugby League Committee resolved not to invite Newtown and West to participate in the Winfield Cup the following year. But Never Say Die West refused to accept the death penalty and a series of battles through the courts kept them alive. The then Magpie secretary, Rick Wade, recalls the extraordinary lengths the club went to to raise the necessary funds to continue the fight in the courts. The main thing to make us financially viable was a rock concert in October 1983 at Lidcombe Oval. Had we not staged that and, and had the result out of it we did, we wouldn't have been able to go to equity. Despite the problems, the Premiership provided many thrilling moments and in many ways buried the controversies of that year. Parramatta's Eric Groth scored the try of the year. In fact, just about any year. Roy Masters St George provided a fairy tale touch to the year. Looking to be out of the finals contention, the Saints won seven straight sudden death matches and got as far as the second semi-final. The Bob Fulton coach Manley set the pace in 83, winning the minor premiership by eight points from Parramatta. It was the year of the introduction of the four-point try and the six-tackle handover, and the new rules suited Parramatta. On grand final day, the Eels' razzle-dazzle back line stole the show. Parramatta led 18-0 two minutes into the second half and the coveted Winfield Cup was on its way out west for the third year in a row. Shortly after the grand final came the surprise news that the Eels' groundbreaking coach Jack Gibson had resigned. Peter Sterling pays the master coach the ultimate tribute. I do think that the most outstanding thing about Jack is if you spoke to the majority of players that Jack has coached, they would say that they not only, A, ended up better footballers, but did end up better people. Nineteen eighty-four was a greatly challenging season. The league hierarchy was on a solid course now, working hard to get it right and put behind the troubles of the early 80s. One of the biggest stories of season 84 surrounded firebrand manly forward Les Boyd. At Brookvale Oval on July 1, Boyd was charged by referee Kevin Roberts with gouging Canterbury hooker Billy Johnston. Boyd was found guilty and suspended for the eighth time. It was the end of the Sydney career of the enigmatic Boyd. I never really thought I was victimised at the stage that, that I got suspended, you know, bad suspensions. You know, I did the wrong thing and probably deserved my suspensions. Um, you know, but now when you look back and see that I was probably the only one that was singled out myself and Bobby Cooper for that length of suspension, it, um, it probably does look a bit that way. But, uh, you know, I, don't, I paid, I done the crime and paid the time. Among the magic moments was a run to the finals by the much-loved South Sydney. An inspiring fight back from 14-0 down to topple Manly 22-18 in a semi-final. But the run ended there. Defence and discipline were now the key words in rugby league. St George came within a whisker of a grand final berth. 
They looked home at 7-4 with three minutes on the clock. But Mr. Unstoppable Eric Groth charged for the line at the Paddington end, carrying St. Steve Rogers with him to snatch the match from St. grasp. It would later be said the final series that year was the best in memory. Parramatta, coached by John Money, was looking for four straight when it took on Warren Ryan's Canterbury in the grand final. The moment of the match came in the second half. With Ray Price injured, Canterbury's Mark Bugden found a gap and scooted through. Bugden will score! Bugden has gone from dummy half easily! Chris Mortimer's conversion made it 6-4 and that was it for the scoring. Canterbury, Winfield Cup champions in this their 50th year in the competition. Success on the field was reflected off the field as well. Financially, the club raked in more than a million dollars before their league's club grant. Drained of their playing talent, West won only one game in 1984 and yet again the league voted them out of the competition. Court battles continued and even though the league eventually won the right to control their own destiny, the Magpies survived. A move to Campbelltown and a new home ground in Orana Park, they're saving great. A tackle by Canterbury's Mark Bugden, which smashed Steve Rogers' jaw, provided a sour opening to the 1985 season. The arrival of Monday Night Premiership football introduced us to the Rockettes. There were fireworks of plenty, and eyebrows were raised at the appearance of a furry creature known as Wacker the Emu. There was a miracle at the Sydney Cricket Ground one afternoon when East climbed off the floor to beat Parramatta 22-20 after being down 20 points to four after 56 minutes. Yes. Along with the signs of growth, the season also produced great sadness. In August, the rugby league world mourned the passing of the little master, Clive Churchill. Prolific point scorer Mick Cronin eclipsed Graham Eady's premiership point scoring record of 1,917 points, notching 14 points in Parramatta's victory over Penrith in a semi-final. It was the Panthers first. There was an extra edge to the premiership centred on Canterbury, where relations between coach Ryan, captain Mortimer and secretary Peter Moore were fraying noticeably. The rift between Mortimer and Ryan widened as the grand final with St George approached. When it came to the big game, St George were left lamenting a one-point defeat. A field goal, the deciding factor. He's got the, the Bulldogs set the pace and led 7-0 until six minutes from the end when Steve Slippery Morris scored a converted try to make it 7-6. But Steve Mortimer's men were in command. Canterbury had won their first ever back-to-back -back premierships with Turvey's kicking game, the killer weapon. The central figures in the Bulldogs' triumphs, Captain Mortimer and Coach Ryan, reveal that the passing of a decade has done little to repair their fragile relations. I feel that, obviously, he felt threatened. Um, if someone else's name was on the back page and not the coach's, then there was a case to answer for. And uh, I was just basically sick and tired of looking over my shoulder. Stevie, like a lot of ageing footballers and over-the-hill or punch-drunk fighters and ageing actresses, they're all very similar in that they, they're not very good judges of their own form. Season 1986 saw a return to boom times for rugby league. Turnstiles were clicking over with more than 1.5 million fans attending matches, the most ever in the six-tackle era. Parramatta Stadium became a reality. Mick Cronin was there for the celebrations, but not in a playing capacity. Sidelined at the time with a severe eye injury, the Crow kicked off Parramatta's big opener with St George, and cheered on by a parochial Eels crowd, Parramatta walloped the St George side 36-6. Reflecting the big money rugby league was attracting, a story surfaced of Kerry Packer and his attempted bid to buy Queensland aces Wally Lewis and Gene Miles for the Manly Club, where his pal Bob Fulton was coach. The offers were staggering. A reported $150,000 each, which was very big money for those times. I went in there and uh, uh, he said, OK, how much? And I said, well, you're supposed to offer me the money. And I say, yes or no. He just said, I'm the boss here. How much? 
And I went to ask for the amount, and I thought, no, I, I'd better ask for a, for a bigger amount of money. Because he's a businessman, he'll, uh, he'll chop it in half and try and work out in something from there. So I asked for, for almost double of what I was going to get. He started laughing and uh, looked at me and he said, OK, you're easy, get out and get the next bloke in. Contractual problems with the QRL stopped the daring bid. Off the field, all eyes were focused on the bizarre attempt by Sydney doctor Geoffrey Edelston to buy the Cronulla Sharks as a birthday present for his wife Leanne. Are these the boys? Are these the players? Not surprisingly, this embarrassing episode ended in failure. 1986 saw the death of John Dallas Donnelly. He collapsed and died while surfing in Byron Bay. Dallas, a mixture of fire and brimstone on the field and often on the wrong side of the judicial system, was one of the game's great characters. His mentor at West's, Roy Masters, recalls just how tough he really was. He'd broken a cheekbone in a game and uh, the doctor said, look, he's got to have it operated on. It took me about six hours to track him down on this particular Sunday night and finally I found him in a little pub surrounded by a half a dozen of his mates from the Gunnedah and the bush on about his 86th schooner and I said, Dallas, you've just got to go to hospital and I put him in a cab and took him into St Vincent's that very night. His eye, of course, rapidly blacking and becoming puffed and purple and weeping and, and uh, when I took him into St Vincent's hospital and uh, the doctor had a look at it and he said, Dallas said, how long am I going to be here? And the doctor said, well, probably 10 days. And Dallas said, 10 days? And the doctor said, yes, almost certainly. And Dallas said, well, in that case, he said, you better check my ribs. He said, this one here has been broken for about a month, he said, and this knee, he said, can you fix it up? It hasn't been any good all year. During the season, Judiciary Chairman Gentleman Jim Coman stepped down. His resignation followed a disagreement with colleagues on a verdict in a spear tackle case against Parramatta's Jeff Bugden. Veteran journalist Alan Clarkson recalls the significance of Coman's contribution to the game. I thought he did a magnificent job, Jim. There, there, were, a lot, there were major problems as far as the game was concerned then. There was a lot of foul play, you know, and that's the only way you could put it down. There was a lot of foul play. And Jim came in and Jim knew the game. I mean, he'd played the game with university. And I remember he used to sit behind us every, every day out of the, every Saturday, out of the city cricket ground. And he was there to watch the matches all the time. And so he, he was an avid follower of the game and he loved the game. And he, he knew what had to be done. And he knew it had to be cleaned up. And he and the committee went about cleaning it up and they, they did a great job. The try of the year belonged once again to Parramatta's Eric Groth. For the first time in 50 years, St George failed to make the semi-finals in any grade. And after 75 years, the Sydney Sports Ground staged this last league game. The old ground was soon to be demolished to make way for a much-discussed super stadium. The finale penalty goals would be the last of his career. He retired on a winning note along with... 1987 would prove to be quite a year with vibrant marketing of the game and a more professional approach by players, coaches and officials helping the league reap unprecedented profits. And the New South Wales Rugby League had a new chairman. Ken Arthurson had taken over from Tom Bellew. The Bears had a refurbished home. North Sydney Oval, seven and a half million dollar facelift attracted wide praise. In contrast, South Sydney elected to quit Redfern Oval, their home ground since 1948. Canberra's Mal Meninga missed much of the season, breaking his arm in a collision with a goalpost at Seaford Oval in May, but his absence didn't stop a thrilling charge to the grand final by the Green Machine. Fans were treated to some spectacular pre-match entertainment that culminated with the construction of a model of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. When it came to the decider... That day, Kevin Ward, you know, he just jumped off the plane from England I think three days earlier. So he'd come from probably eight to, eight to 10 degrees to 32 degrees. Lost a couple of us, so Ronnie Gibbs and myself might be feeling the heat. Uh, he just led the way for us. On the day. It's 1988, and Sydney lets down her hair to help the nation celebrate its bicentennial year. Australia's 200th year was also Rugby League's 81st, and in the space of five years, the game had undergone a revolution. 
the 1988 season began with the game settling into a new home. The magnificent $62 million Sydney Football Stadium. But problems surfaced on a rainy opening night. Fans scrambled to find shelter and criticism of inadequate roof cover to shield them from the elements quickly surfaced. The competition had three new kids on the block and they attracted plenty of attention. A massive crowd of 26,340 turned up for the Newcastle Knights' first home game and the fans' enthusiasm was only slightly dampened when Parramatta beat them 28-4. The Gold Coast Giants, later to be the Seagulls, joined the competition and went down to Canterbury 21-10. The Brisbane Broncos' entry was triumphant. Stepping onto Lang Park before a crowd of over 17,000, they toyed with Manly and won 44 to 10. Lewis has done it so easily. The inclusion of the new teams boosted crowd figures to stunning proportions. On a weekend in August, crowd figures topped the 100,000 mark for the first time since 1969. But when it came down to the business end of the competition, it was left to a couple of oldies to claim centre stage. The year is remembered for the charge to the grand final by Balmain, one of the 1908 originals. The Tigers defied the critics and the odds by winning six sudden death matches in a row. Balmain's ace was Ellery Hanley. Coached by the shrewd Warren Ryan and led by the inspirational Wayne Pierce, the Tigers made it a series to remember. But on grand final day, their big gun Hanley was knocked out in back play via a controversial tackle by Terry Lamb and a fairy tale ending to their triumphant march was thwarted. I remember being in the changing rooms and uh, I thought I was in the Wigan dressing room at the time and I think that it, it, it could have been a combination of Terry Lamb hitting me on the button on the chin or it, it could have been the ground. When my head went back and I hit the ground, I was concussed completely, I didn't know where I was. And um, I don't blame anybody, I think that's football. Canterbury, though, coached by Phil Gould, was sharper and more effective on the day and won 24 to 12. And a very good one as Hagen crosses... There was an emotional moment for Bulldogs fans when legend Steve Mortimer took the field in the dying minutes. He'd been out of action with a broken arm and his brief cameo appearance was a memorable one as Mortimer's fabulous career drew to its close. Rugby League's founding fathers, James Gilton and Henry Hoyle and Victor Trumper, would surely have rubbed their eyes in disbelief had they been alive to witness the events of 1989. In particular, the masterstroke signing of the rocking grandmother Tina Turner as league's image maker. Tina's hit of 1985, What You Get Is What You See, was shaped into a commercial by the leading Sydney advertising agency, Hertz Walpole. The result was an explosive marketing coup that lifted the game's profile like never before. Hertz Walpole's general manager, Paul Mackay, recalls the real trick that led to the signing of Tina was getting to her manager, Roger Davies. And the rest is history. He was stunned that we'd actually asked. He thought, uh, I remember him saying to John Quayle and I, he said, uh, are you crazy? I mean, do you know what this will cost? And uh, I can remember John Quayle saying, well, listen, Roger, we, we've got no money, but I'm sure it'll be good for Tina Turner's career. In season 89, South Sydney set the pace. Coached by George Piggins, South won the minor premiership, winning 12 straight along the way. In the game's ultimate award, the Rothmans medal, there was an historic tie between Cronulla's Gavin Miller and Newcastle's Mark Sargent. Campbell of League Supremacy, the Winfield Cup, came alive as part of the pre-match entertainment featuring the two men who were its subjects, Norm Proven and Arthur Summons. The Balmain celebrated that day while Balmain players sank to the ground in utter distress. It's ever feelings in the game of rugby league, you know, it was after my four breaks in a frustrating period and um, the Raiders, um, you know, were first time ever, well, second time ever made the grand final and won it. And, we did it from fourth position, nobody said we could win it, we were underdogs and a lot of things going against us that particular day and we come through with the goods. And, uh... ...themselves amongst the finest players of rugby league's modern era. It was 1990 and phase two of the exciting new marketing of rugby league featuring Tina Turner became a reality. It was to become Rugby League's anthem for the 90s. 
But 1990 was to be a year of crisis. Two five-letter words would attract unwanted headlines for the code. Drugs and draft. The league had instituted strict guidelines to combat the presence of drugs in the code, and in June 1990, a South Sydney training session was raided and players tested. Ten players tested positive to social drugs. Causing further headaches was the attempted introduction of a player draft. The league had hoped that such a system would help create a level playing field among the clubs. But the Players Association deemed it an unreasonable restraint of trade and the courts agreed. The season was a disaster for Wally Lewis, who in 1990 was sacked as captain of the Brisbane Broncos. Badly tore a hamstring and then broke an arm in a match against St George. There was both controversy and a few laughs when Balmain's Steve Blocker Roach patted referee Eddie Ward on the head at Brookvale and then abused a touch judge on his way to the sin bin during a match against Manly. I sort of just, just naturally just patted him on the head to sort of say, or patted him. I didn't really mean anything by it. I just meant to say, well, mate, I'm not dirty on you. Like, it's, uh, it's just that keeps running in here all game, you know. So I invariably give him a mouthful on the way off. And uh, I remember at the judiciary, they said to me, um, you know, have you got anything to say? And I, and I stood up and I remember saying that, um, you know, the game's lost its colour. When it was showdown, drew a record crowd of 41,535 to the Sydney Football Stadium. What a match this is going to be. For Penrith skipper Roy Simmons, the loss cut deep. Um, I think my wife found me sitting out under a tree over here crying about uh, two o'clock in the middle of the night and it took me home. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was bad. It was, uh, took a while to get over that. Rugby league's boom continued in season 91. There were record crowds, record gates, and the game explored new territories. Winfield Cup matches headed off on a travelling rugby league roadshow. Games were played at Darwin's Richardson Park, at the famous Adelaide Oval, and also at Perth's Wacker Ground. It was a year with its fair widespread resentment when it was revealed they were well on the way to overspending again in 91, and the Raiders were branded cheats. The row over tobacco sponsorship intensified with the passing of the Tobacco Advertising Prohibition Bill through the State Legislative Assembly in 1991. South's Wayne Chisholm made the most publicised tackle of the year when he downed referee Jeff Weeks in a match at the Sydney Football Stadium. Chisholm was suspended for 10 weeks. The final series provided glittering football. Now coached by Graham Lowe, Manly tested Canberra to the hilt in their semi-final before going down 36-24. And North Sydney provided a fairy tale touch, producing an outstandingly competitive year from a club which hadn't won a premiership since 1922. The Bears just missed. They went down 16-14 against Penrith in the major semi before losing to Canberra 30 points to 14 in the preliminary final. The decider was something special. A fair of 12-6 at half time. Penrith stormed home to win 19-12 in a thriller. And get players in this side, in fact, there's a few champions. Goes down. Goyer gets it. Racing yes. That's it. The grand final's gone. Season 1992 kicked off with Brisbane showing signs of things to come, licking Cronulla 30 points to two before a crowd of 20,000 at Lang Park. There were many fabulous moments as the season unfolded, but a downside too. The league world mourned the deaths of two young players, Penrith Ben Alexander and East James Matthews, both of them victims of car accidents. In April, league's little general Peter Sterling dislocated his troublesome shoulder in a match against Western Suburbs. Facing a barrage of media the next day, he announced his retirement. To retire is frustrating because I know that I still have so much to offer. You know, I know that I can be competitive. Um, and to sort of go out this way wasn't the way I was planning. Sterling was one of a large number of Winfield Cup stars whose playing careers ended that year. Among them, the King, Wally Lewis, Steve Blocker Roach and Michael O'Connor. Brisbane played their last match at Lang Park on August 23 and went out winners. On an historic Rothmans medal night, the award first taken out by Cronulla's Terry Hughes in 1968, a player from outside Sydney took the coveted award for the first time. The medal on the night belonged to Brisbane's Alan Langer. Adding their own touch of history, Illawarra and Newcastle marched into the finals for the first time. 
on the big day. Allocated its own seat, the Winfield Cup held pride of place on the flight back to Brisbane. There, the city went wild with Alfie Langer tossed like a cork in the ocean by the deliriously happy crowd. Yeah, I took a few hits and grabs that night too, but uh, as I say, we took, a, we took a bit of a risk there in doing it, but uh, I don't think we'll do it again. The year ended with the historic decision to expand the competition to 20 teams in 1995. The Winfield Cup was moving ahead at breakneck pace. As season 1993 dawned, the game's pin-up boy, Andrew Eddinghausen, found himself in unusual territory, embroiled in controversy and court battle. In February, Eddinghausen was awarded $350,000 in damages after a magazine published a photo of him nude in the shower during the 1990 Kangaroo Tour. Settlement was later reduced on appeal. In March, Brisbane's ANZ Stadium was open to a massive 51,517 crowd for the Broncos' Parramatta game, won 12-8 by the visitors in a major shock. The Bulldogs stayed the Multicultural Day promotion, and it was a smashing success, drawing a record 27,804 to watch Canterbury trounce Parramatta 42-6 at Belmore. There was much discussion centred on Alan Langer, who escaped disciplinary action after a tripping incident. There was a major drama on the Gold Coast when Seagull's general manager, Vic Folotarek, claimed publicly that Wally Lewis couldn't coach. Eventually, Lewis, Queensland's most famous player, stood down. In August, the brilliant Brett Kenny played his 259th first grade game breaking Ray Price's record for Parramatta. The Eels' enduring champion would later hang up his boots. Nearing the semis, Canberra's hopes of winning a premiership nosedive when halfback Ricky Stewart fractured and dislocated his ankle in a match against Parramatta. An early quote of 40 to 1 to win the Rothmans medal, Stewart defied the odds to become Canberra's first winner of the award, accepting the prize on crutches. It's September 24, and Sydney celebrates as rarely before with the news that the city of Sydney, Sydney won the right to stage the year 2000 Olympics. And Brisbane made it two in a row on grand final day, once again at the expense of St George in an unspectacular match. The Broncos did it impressively, three tries to nil. By 1994, the new 10-metre rule had produced a fast attacking style of football. Season 1994 had its sensations. Souths in particular were pinned down by controversy with alleged match-fixing rumours, even though exhaustive police inquiries found no evidence of dark deeds. Relations between the powerful Brisbane Broncos and the New South Wales Rugby League were at breaking point. Behind the scenes, there was talk of the formation of a Super League breakaway competition, a threat to the ARL's control of the game. Rugby league stars shone as always. In May, Andrew Eddinghausen, the sport's beloved ET, scored his 100th first grade try. That year, he would also play his 200th first grade game. In July, Penrith coach Phil Gould resigned with a fair slab of the season still to go, announcing he was moving to eastern suburbs for 1995. The Roosters had parted company with Mark Murray. Western suburbs cut their ties with Warren Ryan and club stalwart Tommy Radonikas was announced as his replacement. In a milestone, Terry Lamb returned from many weeks missed with a broken arm to play his 300th first grade game in his 15th Winfield Cup season. Great controversy surrounded an apparent leak of information on the Rothmans medal voting. It came as no great surprise when the big tip David Fairley claimed league's most coveted award. Decision day. And Canberra sent skipper Mal Meninga out on a winning note with a devastating 36 points to 12 grand final victory over Canterbury. Rugby league swept into the last year of the Winfield Cup on a late summer breeze of hope and optimism. And on the horizon, dark storm clouds were gathering. The Winfield Cup's opening round drew huge crowds as the four new clubs made their colourful entrances. Peter Mulholland's Western Reds were the only winners on debut, beating St George 28-16 at the Wacker. The other three went down, but with honour. Within a fortnight, the national media, dominated by the astonishing story 
of the Super League takeover bid and then of the Australian Rugby League's resolute fight back. And yet when the dust settled, to an extent, it was the class teams which had held things together well enough to set the pace. When the finals time came around, there was general agreement. All at Winfield, thank you for having us for so long as part of the Rugby League family. Thank you all and good luck. In 1995, Rugby League turned 100. In 1895, the split that led to League's birth had been between the new game and the old Rugby Union. But in 1995, the split was within the game itself. And that's why the pain was so deep. The bravery and wonderful athleticism. It had been an association the Rugby League treasured from day one. We would never be where we are today without Winfield when the game didn't have a sponsorship a company like them came into it and um, you know all the debate about cigarettes and that sort of thing I don't think Winfield ever put a demand on the game ever on its administration uh, but set out in 1982 to say make the big game bigger those qualities of resilience resoluteness intelligence determination cooperation one to the other never been more needed in rugby league's past than they are today. 14 glorious years, the game has triumphed, the players have grown, football has been the winner. The Winfield Cup truly symbolised rugby league as the greatest game of all.